I'm so happy to know about it and, and to be invited so early on. The talk that I want to give today, it's, it's absolutely a work in progress, is to focus on the first word in your name there on all, in all offensive. Because um, it's one of the, the hotter issues in uh, research about cyber conflict nowadays is about this offense defense balance. And it's one of the uh, areas where I think I have a particular voice that I wanted to share because I have been a cyber practitioner. Um, you know, having had to defend computer systems, uh, not hands-on keyboards particularly, um, but uh, for the military, at, at the, the world's first joint cyber command, the JTFCND at Goldman Sachs and other places, right? I've been on the other end and I've had to be a, a defender. And now that I'm in academia, um, I'm trying to bring that perspective into many areas and offense defense balance is one where I've seen perhaps the biggest gap between academia and practitioner and policymaker communities. So the three things to cover today um, are these. And so the first, first one of those we'll, we'll, we'll move on from quickly. And it's in internet, I don't know how many of us are international relations scholars or, or, or different scholars, but a lot of our questions have been, I think, the wrong questions. For example, when I, when I look in the international relations literature on offense defense, it's, or escalatory, it's, is cyber escalatory? Is cyber an attack an act of war? Uh, in almost all of the, or um, when it's statements, sometimes it's declarative statements. Well, of course we know that cyberspace is borderless or that um, cyber operations um, are hard to attribute. And in almost every case, when you hear that declarative statement or you hear that question of is cyber X, Y, and Z, it is usually the wrong framing. And I've framed it that way myself many times. It is almost always better to say, under what conditions is cyber escalatory? And that's the table there on the right that I did with my colleague, Bob Jervis, part of looking at different conditions under why cyber might be de-escalatory um, uh, and destabilizing or, or stabilizing. And the same thing. On the question isn't, is cyber offense or defense advantages? Under what conditions is it offense or defense? Or if it's a declarative statement, under what conditions are borders in cyberspace weaker or somewhat stronger? So anytime you find yourself as a scholar setting that up as a declarative statement or a simple question of is it X, Y, or a Z, please pull back and aim for the conditions. Because um, you, you will much more likely be on the path of truth and a paper that will stand the test of time. So applying that to the offense-defense balance. Um, people that are IR scholars might be familiar with it. Um, but even if you're not, you can certainly see the balance as it gets discussed in things like the difference between World War I and World War II. Right? There was a sense that in the run-up to World War I that armies thought that conflict was going to be offense advantage and that therefore they need to rush into it and get as much um, as many gains as they could when it turns out it ended up being defense balance or this is one of the arguments that made. So it not only helped cause World War I by rushing into it, but it took the, the generals a long time to figure out that it seemed like the defenders had some advantages. Um, they thought that in going into World War II and it led to the Maginot lines, but of course the combination of, of technologies of the radio and the tank combined with operational concepts like Blitzkrieg led to um, a more offense advantage. And, if, uh, and this then fed into early ideas about nuclear stability and, and um, arms control and how can we keep um, nuclear arms from being used um, if they were so offense advantage because there wasn't much that you could be 
could be done to defend against them. Uh, my colleague, uh, Steve Biddle, who has the office um, uh, just down the hall, um, thought that was overdone and has come in and a lot of his writing has been saying, um, you're focusing on the consequences of offense defense without actually establishing if it is offense defense. So looking at the causes, the balance is cause versus balance has effect. And he's found that you can't argue that in general, that offense and defense in the military, that you can have the systemic effect. You've got to look at how it plays out in an individual battle. And his, and his work um, has been extensive on this about looking at how this plays out in, in individual ba in battles and, and finds out that technology is, isn't, it gets too much focus compared to force employment. You've got to use your forces in the right way. And so within cyber, there was this longstanding and relatively unchallenged sense that cyber was offense advantaged. Um, and, but IR scholars have really only been diving into that in the last five years. Um, ben Buchanan, Cybersecurity Dilemma, he, he doesn't hit offense defense specifically as much as maybe some other scholars, but his entire book is about the, how the offense has the advantage, the attackers are able to do so much because the attackers are able to do so much that defenders will use cyber espionage, basically offensive capabilities so they can learn about what the other side is doing. And he looks at this back and forth um, that's largely driven by this, this offense advantage, although he doesn't necessarily put it in quite so specific those terms, I think. And by the way, Ben is, is perhaps one of my, certainly one of my favorite international relations scholars, because he's the one that most I feel decided to learn my field of cybersecurity and how it works, and then stepped back and said, all right, what tools do I have to understand this? Many of the other scholars said, oh, I have all of this this panoply of tools and methodologies, how can I use them to understand cybersecurity without actually understanding it first? Um, Goldman, Hartmesh, and, and later Fisher Keller um, said it's not offense advantage, it's persistence advantage. And they put the emphasis on the persistent part of that, not the offense. And that got picked up then by Cyber Command that saying like, right again, it went from being kind of this IR idea of an offense persistent environment that you always have to be on acting, right? It's not saying that the attacker necessarily has the advantage, but the advantage goes to the side that's always moving and is agile. That then got picked up and is now essentially strategy in the United States and, the, and by the nations that are following the United States. Um, Gartsky and Lindsay had one of the major papers on this that they said, well, if there is any, advan any advantage, and there might not be, but if there is an offense advantage, um, it's because there's ease of deception. It's not necessarily ease of attack, it's ease of deception. And they came up with saying, hey, all right, and, and anyhow, the cyber offense defense balance is conditional, which is kind of like a biddle point. Right, it might not be systemic, but there it, it's 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 conditional. Um, Rebecca Slayton picked that argument up uh, in her 2017 piece, uh, who said sweeping claims about offense defense balance are misguided, um, and you can only right. She she takes the point um, maybe to the extreme in saying there's absolutely like it's misguided to think of it as systemic, and you can only think about it as dyadic of two adversaries, right? This is the middle point, right? You can't say whether there's, there's um, you know, anything systemic. You have to look at this particular army faced off against this particular army in these circumstances and how they're using their forces and how that's, and how that's going to play out. Um, and so those, the things that Gartsky and others said, hey, you know, it's gonna be conditional. Um, Slayton uh, argues a lot that, hey, you've got to look at those organizational skills and technologies, um, and then dives into a particular example about Stuxnet by looking at the actual cost, right? And it, it bringing it down to, you know, to kind of the dollars. And then the, the last scholar I'll mention of the great work by uh, Brandon Valeriano Jensen and, and, and his collaborators, Ben Jensen and, and Ryan Manis, um, based on large end data sets. And what they're looking at, not necessarily the offense defense 
balance per se, but can our states achieving uh, achieving the outcomes that they want? And in and in in multiple pieces have said no. You know, it's not really obvious that um, they're achieving the outcomes that they want. Um, sometimes, especially Valeriano, can go a little bit farther and will categorically say there's no offense advantage. Um, he's even tweeted that like the offense defense uh, question is stupid and we need to move on from it, um, which is, um, uh, again, his, his, their work is great and they have fabulous findings, but it's one of the criticisms that sometimes the international relations work can look very narrowly. Like we're looking at the bounds of international relations um, and findings that can apply to um, the behavior of states during a certain time. Right? The, the folks that are looking at the behavior of states are looking at the behavior of states over the last 20 years, 15 years, when in general, there hasn't been a lot of cross-border invasions, right? There has been fewer armed attacks since the end of the Cold War than there has been the norm between states. And so they're taking these findings from um, a particular period of time um, and can apply and can sometimes either specifically or seemingly say there is no offense balance, defense balance, rather than saying between states during a time of relative peace, the way states have been using these offensive capabilities, there doesn't seem to be an offense advantage. Um, right, I mean, this can change overnight as we'll talk about. And the issue that I'll talk about most in this session is they've tended not to, to critically engage with the computer security literature. Um, I would say Slayton and Buchanan do best at this. Um, specifically about persistence advantage, it's likely to be a subset of offense advantage, right? I mean, you can't, persistent engagement is based on positional maneuvering through systems that aren't your own, right? That if the United States see the Russians pivot through a Turkish system to a German system to try and get into the United States, that cyber command can follow with them um, as they're on that path and play one-on-one -on -one defense. That statement only makes sense if the attackers can easily get into systems that aren't their own. Um, and that can only make sense under cer certain circumstances. And if anything, persistent engagement requires a systemic offense advantage or it doesn't really make any sense. And certainly if cyberspace advantage is defense, we would neither need persistent engagement um, nor would it be possible. So two quick thought experiments to help. Imagine if, like think about some of these findings from the IR scholars, especially I would say here, um, Slayton, maybe, maybe Valeriano and others. And by the way, I might, I might even add the work, the great work of Erica Beauregard and Sean Monaghan. Um, imagine if states, instead of largely wanting to do low and slow attacks, mostly for espionage, decided that as soon as they get sufficient access, they're gonna pull a Sony style attack, right? That not patches instead of being the brazen and reckless exception become more like the norm. And we, and we can imagine a, situa a geopolitical situation where that would be the case. Great power competition where states wanna throw each other off. They feel like there hasn't been any price to be paid. They don't want to compete with actual kinetic weapons. And so they decide that more routine cyber espionage of each other is a good thing. And is in fact a de-escalatory because it's less likely to cause um, a strong reaction from the other side. So all of a sudden these international relations findings that say there's no offense advantage because look, no one's causing that you know, large scale um, incidents. It turns out those findings only apply to the behavior of states under circum certain circumstances and nothing to do with actually using offensive, the potential of offensive capabilities online. Similar, another uh, thought experiment uh, having to do with um, persistent engagement and persistence advantage. Imagine there's a slider of offense defense advantage that goes from one to 10. If, per, if that slider is set at one, so attacks are incredibly easy. The attackers don't just have the advantage, they have supremacy. What does that do with our ideas of persistent engagement defend forward? Or the argument that it's not offense advantage, it's, it's, it's persistent advantage. 
Um, well, I mean, it, it seems more important, right? It, it doesn't particularly change um, the theory that it's not persistent engagement or that's not persistent advantage. Um, but imagine if defense as a whole gets better across the entire internet. All of a sudden, the, the argument that we need persistent engagement to defend forward, it starts to evaporate. Certainly the, the argument that it's not a, that, that it's persistent advantage, it starts to go away, right? If defense got significantly better, then the need to do pers uh, persistent engagement starts to fade away, I think. So to dive in, right? To me, it's about under what conditions. So let's look at the conditions. And I've so far found four. And by the way, I really wanted to thank Rebecca Slate for her work on this. This was originally going to be a very breezy blog that I um, just me saying, yeah, you're all wrong. And then right, Rebecca's work was so good that it really forced me into developing um, these different ways of thinking about it. And so I've got the dyadic, strategic asset, and systemic frameworks. I'm going to talk less about dyadic and strategic because I think those have been relatively well represented by, by Slate and Valerio and others. Dyadic, we're talking about dyadic, we're talking about individual entities in an individual operation or a longer campaign. For example, the, GR, the Russian GRU military intelligence against the DNC or the GRU against a particular Ukrainian electrical plant or electrical grid. Right, you've got one attacking entity, their capabilities, their tools, their personnel, their training, their procedures, and any outside support that they can get or are getting against a defender. Their personnel, their tools, their capabilities, um, uh, their procedures, and any external support that they're going to get. Incredibly useful framework that I am not trying to demean, but it is only one framework. The strategic framework. And by the way, I got that phrase from um, John Lindsay. I had, been, I had been calling it something different. Is this back and forth of states over time in active contention? Here, the attack on their defenders aren't entities, but they're the nation states themselves. And I think that work by Valeriano and his co-authors does a good job of exploring this back and forth of states over time. There are elements that they miss, but that's okay. They're doing, they're, they're doing um, amazing work and trying to assemble large end data sets. That is different from what we're talking about, the asset or the systemic framework. And I'll be diving into those, of it, those um, next. And I'm diving into them because I think they're the two that have been ignored by the international relations scholarship the most. And they're both absolutely fundamental to computer scientists and practitioners. Um, when we talk about our uh, attacker advantage, um, this is where the conversation started 50 years ago. And the main reports have all been rooted in talking about the offense defense balance. There's no substantial literature saying there is no systemic effect and there's sure no systemic literature that says, hey, the defense has the advantage, we're good here. So when you're hearing the IR, IR theorists say there's nothing as, that's systemic and that you can't say there's any offense advantage, it is going against 50 years of computer science literature and lived experience of us as practitioners. So we, the asset framework was the original framework. Prior to the 1960s, the defense had probably superiority because the computer was in a lockdown fucking room. And you, the only people that could get to it were the priesthood. The people had the, the amazing skills and could come in that could, that, that could work on this computer. And around the mid to late 60s, you now started to have remote consoles. You had these terminals. And so these terminals could now communicate with the computer. And you couldn't just do lock the door and do personnel security. You now had this larger problem. And this Defense Science Board report is called the WARE report. It's basically the founding document of computer security that now says, how do we protect it now that you can't just lock the door? The history of computer security is a history of this expanding risk horizon 
of going from the locked room to now the remote terminals to farther and farther and farther out. And it's always been about, ooh, the attackers are now have these new advantages over us because we've now added this connectivity and the complexity and what are we going to do about it? it is, so it started by asset is you've got a computer network or system that you're defending against adversaries. Once we started to connect those computers to the internet, you now had a global system that now had systemic effects in the computer science literature. So once we started to connect to the internet, you now, the, the computer science literature started to follow and say, all right, what's this balance between attacker and defender? So this report, Computers at Risk, 1991, if, if some of you know the work of Herb Lin out at Stanford, he was one of the authors on this report um, when, when he was a, a younger man. And so it starts to say like, hey, the attackers, um, some of these things that we say now, the attackers have to um, um, have, have to just be right once, the defenders have to be all around all the time. It's, it's not necessarily true, it's only true in certain circumstances. Um, but it puts it in place of saying, boy, our problem has really changed now. It's now it's a global system and we've got to systemically improve the defense if we're gonna, if we're gonna have um, any advantage. Um, and again, this was, these aren't obscure reports. If you're learning about computer security policy, these are, the canon that you work with. 2003 is called the Monoculture Report. It was put by um, the leading practitioner academics of the day. Some names that you might not have ever heard of like Becky Bass, who kind of invented firewalls to some main names you might know like Dan Gere and Bruce Schneier, um, Andrew Quarterman. Right? I mean, these were the leading lights that said, boy, another way that you get systemic vulnerability isn't just because you're connected to the internet, like computers at risk, but you have common mode failures, right? We're all using the same software, in this case, Microsoft, which creates aggregated risk. Right? And if you're talking about aggregated risk, you're talking about a systemic effect. And they gave example after example, for example, Nimda and Slammer, which were big worms of the time that were exploiting Microsoft caused these cascading failures because everybody was using Microsoft. And so it gave the attackers this, this incredible advantage because it wasn't one-to-one, -one, right? It wasn't one attacker on one defender. It's not asset or dyadic. It's do one, right, one worm, and it affects millions at the same time. And the, uh, this is one of the things that gets missed by the IR literature. If you're thinking about a dyad, explain to me solar winds. Explain to me Microsoft Up Exchange about how one did 30,000. And the dyadic does not help you to understand that. It is ignored. Uh, more recently, some of my work, we, um, we got together some of the top academics and practitioners um, some of the most famed CISOs in the business, chief information security officers like Phil Venables and Ed Amoroso, to say, how can we have a more defensible internet? It was based in the systemic um, of saying, how can we give the defender the greatest advantage over attackers at the greatest scale in these trials? And we actually went through of five decades of defensive innovations in technology operations and policy to say, which are the ones that gave the defender the most advantage? So you can imagine me being a practitioner and reading these statements by colleagues who are really smart and I really respect saying it's sweeping and misguided that for 50 years, we've been saying there's a systemic offense advantage. So the IR literature needs to do better about engaging with this computer security literature and the lived experience of practitioners. So why is there a systemic advantage? I'm, I'm still working on these. Um, they tend to be, and these are the first three are quite related, connectivity, scale, and com complexity. We can dive into those in the Q&A if we need to. Um, and also, of course, the point that Lindsay and Gartsky brought out of deception. So 
I mean, it's no surprise that I come down and saying, look, cyberspace systemically favors the attacker, right? It's, it's five decades. We've been, this has been since 1970 that we have known this in the, com in the computer security literature and as practitioners. We can do more to test it empirically. Um, but um, IR needs to get on, the, get on board with this. Um, now that doesn't mean that it's going to play out in dyadic or it's gonna play out in strategic. Like when Brandon Valeriano looks at, and his colleagues look at their large end data set and say, well, we don't see that they're necessarily gaining their strategic effects. That doesn't mean that that statement is incorrect, right? My colleague, Greg Rache, who got the first PhD in international relations and cyber, um, and he, and he did this P dissertation on comparison of US bombing um, strategy and theory in the 1930s versus how it actually played out in World War II, right? The bomber is going to get through, the bomber is offense advantage, and yet it didn't mean that, that the bombers actually had the effect that the bomber enthusiasts like Doolittle, Duhay, um, uh, Harris said that it was going to. But even when the bombers get through, it didn't have the, the operational strategic effect that had been promised. And so it can still be offense advantage at the tactical level and still not deliver the effects. Um, also, I think a lot of my IR colleagues hate the idea of offense advantage, eh, not hate, are primed against the idea of offense advantage because they see it being used for strategies that they dislike. If offense, if cyber is offense advantage, then maybe we have to use offense in response. And that doesn't necessarily follow. Um, so um, I'll only, uh, my, my resulting paper isn't going to touch on these as much. I suspect on the asset, like if you look at computer security, the at software is notoriously insecure, always has been. Um, it is conditional. I mean, Microsoft and others that put high quality and have, have mature coding um, uh, can do better and formal methods. Um, is a computer coding tech, computer engineering technique that's starting to come back and, and tilts that back towards the defense. Um, dyadic, I see the system effects are strong. That of course in the dyads, it comes down to the actual attacker and defender. But in general, you need, I'm sorry to use the American aspect of this, right? If you're, if you're a varsity team, then you're, you're, um, you're exceptionally good. And you generally need an exceptionally good team to defeat a junior varsity offense. Um, if, you've got a, if you've got a varsity offense that's coming at you, you have to be all-stars. And if you've got all-stars that are coming at you, God help you. There's very, 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 very few organizations in the world that can, that can defend against an all-star team. But that doesn't guarantee the operational strategic results. Now, I suspect the more that we do things like the Internet of Things, that we're giving the attacker more opportunities to be able to achieve larger scale results for longer. And we can dive into that um, if that's important. And on the strategic, again, I think that it seems to be driven by systemic ad advantage at the tactical, op uh, the technical and operational levels, um, hence persistent engagement, right? Again, if you didn't have the systemic advantage, we wouldn't, be we wouldn't need a strategy like persistent engagement. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that states are gonna be achieving their goals. Um, and again, changes in, a, in technology, like increased dependence and in internet of things can, are gonna change that dependence. I think make it easier for states to achieve um, their goals, but we can still see this can change. If states goals become easier, right? We're just gonna do all of the smash and grab, right? That we don't care about the slow and slow collection of intelligence. We're just gonna go punch people. Uh, in another paper, I called this the clockwork orange internet. Right, it's just ultra violence for the sake of violence. Well, then, if there's if their goals are easier to achieve, then again, that, that has more to say about what states' goals are than anything about states. Um, we're talking about the implications, right? My colleague uh, Bob Jervis has got the officer over there. He argued that a security dilemma is doubly dangerous if it's offense dominant and you can't distinguish offense from defense. That's kind of what we've said about our field. So I say. Cyber might not be doubly dangerous, but maybe quintuply dangerous. 
right? It seems to be offense dominance in many ways. You can't distinguish offense from defense or from espionage, subversion, sabotage, or, or preparing for an attack. There's low barriers. It's not just in an arsenal, you're using it. And you've got a chance of cascading effect like we saw with NotPetya. So the policy recommendations. Um, if there is a systemic offense advantage, as I say, yes, it's possible the best defense is a good offense. I don't think so. Um, I think that's likely to lead to instability, right? All other things, like if we were gonna, all other things were the same, maybe that would be true. I think it leads to escalation, uh, escalation and destabilization. So I think you improve defense to have the systemic advantage, right? If the underlying problem is the attacker has the advantage, the solution is to get defense better and to give defense more advantages. Not to give the, not to do more offense, but to get defense better, which is possible like our work with the New York Suburb Task Force did. My recommendations for IR scholars, again, phrase the questions under what conditions or something similar, please, um, in all of your work. So definitely we've got to think about the systemic advantage and the impact on the most important IR questions, which are dyadic or strategic. And definitely those conditions under dyadic or strategic can absolutely overwhelm the strategic effects. But those strategic effects are there nonetheless. Please critically engage with the computer security literature. We can't just keep going back to the same IR journals. And because this was IS, this is all I need. We've got to engage um, with these things that were in um, uh, the computer science literature. And if you find that your findings are at odds with what's happening from the practitioners, right? Whether that's in cyber or counterinsurgency or other areas, um, we can't just assume that because we are IR scholars and we have tools and methods that our answer must be right. And that others are misguided because of their sweeping claims, right? That requires exploration, that requires engagement to get involved and say, hey, I've got a gap here. I wonder why this is so and to dive into that. And so with that, I'll stop sharing and let me turn it back over to the organizers. Thank you very much, Jason. That was fantastic. It was brilliant to hear your insight on both from the computer security um, perspective, but also bringing in everything from the international relations literature and very clearly outlining, I think, where there are inconsistencies and where people potentially haven't reviewed all the evidence or have theory that is inconsistent with the evidence. Also really appreciated your clear recommendations, both for policymakers and for international relations scholars, which answered both the questions I were gonna ask. Um, so before, um, I've got some questions, I can see them in the Q&A and I've got some from the live stream too. Um, I will start pulling some out, but a note for attendees, if you do want to ask your question, directly uh, with your video and voice, then please just raise your hand and we can call on you too. Um, so the first question I will draw on will be uh, Joe Burton in the chat, who's said, first of all, are some communities or actors predisposed to offensive use of cyber? Do their pre-existing beliefs, experiences, ideas shape whether they use cyber technology offensively or defensively? Great question, Joe. Um, oh, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I see Lily's there. I'm gonna do it really quickly. Greg Rattray, um, it was a, um, the dissertation, the book was called um, Strategic Warfare in Cyberspace, MIT 2001. I mean, really early. Um, he's, he's summarized it in other places, including I think one of the Cyber Analogies books. And he also has compared cyberspace to other, um, the work of other environmental power theorists. For example, Mahan for sea power, Duhay, Mitchell, um, Bomber, Harris for air, um, uh, maybe Klauswitz for ground. Um, and so really interesting work. And, and again, the founding, founding work in our, in our field. Yeah, so uh, for Joe's first, um, Communities or actors predisposed to offensive use of cyber. Yes, I would say there's for, this gets to something that I didn't get to mention. Um, I actually added another slide, but I kind of forgot it was there. On offense, defense, and distinguishability. 
if you read a lot of the IR literature, they place a lot of emphasis on this offense, defense, and distinguishability. Um, which, again, it's, it's under what conditions is that true? That's true for like 1% of offense, for attackers and defenders. Maybe I'll give you 5%. I'll give you 10% um, for that. That's true for militaries. Right? If you've got the legal authority to hack back, like military or FBI, then these two seem like they're, they're two sides of the same coin. For the vast bulk of defenders, like when I was at Goldman, there wasn't, there wasn't a spectrum. Right now, there was just defense. And if, you, and if you proposed, hey, let's use some offense here, you got fired. It's a terrible idea. Um, and so militaries come at it from that point. The more that someone had been a hacker themselves or is part of, um, came in through um, especially penetration testing, then they are more likely to see this as a balance and, a, and it's a back um, and forth. That, that doesn't make it, like again, I'm not saying any of that is wrong. Um, there are particular tools and tactics and procedures that can be the same. But for most, like, no, I mean, like, you, you, you got to patch, right? You've got to find vulnerabilities. You got to get them out there. You've got to do all the kinds of things. You've got to write strategies. You've got to train your workforce, right? You've got all of these things that you've got to do that's part of defense. That has nothing to do with offense. And so, yes, when, you, when you're talking about militaries, when you're talking about espionage forces, um, when you're talking about penetration testers, w without a doubt. And so it's perhaps that I'm underestimating that. And in fact, when we're looking at, like it's actually, it does help on the systemic, right? One reason that we, like I'm drinking a mug, for God's sake, from Rapid7, who are known for like Metasploit. They're, I mean, they're, they're as much an offense company as they're a defense company in, men, in many ways. Um, but that doesn't mean that that has to wipe out any thinking about offense defense advantage because some of the, some of the things are the same. Um, and actually that would get, I've got a paper that's coming out right now, uh, soon, I hope. Um, um, if anyone's here from the Journal of Cybersecurity, sorry, it's taken us a while, with Jack Snyder um, on, that touches on strategic culture. Um, and um, there's also been good work by Sally White that's, um, and um, Rebecca Slayton um, that's looked on how different parts of the military culture have come in and expressed themselves in how they you know, how they operate in cyberspace. So really good work. So that was Rebecca Slayton and Sally White that I just name dropped. Perfect, thank you. I'll take, um, I'll read out a few questions that we've had come in from the live stream and I'll read out two at once because both of them talk about liberal democracies and the approach to cyberspace. And the first one is, is the increasing militarization of cyberspace drifting liberal democracies ever closer to authoritarian approaches to cyberspace? The second one is, how can liberal Western democracies take a values-based approach to defending themselves in cyberspace while also furthering their interests? So how this fits into framework. Yeah, that's great. Um, the, and by the way, I think there's an advent, um, I, and one, it's a paper that I really need to get with a political economist to write because I suspect there's an, uh, there's an endemic advantage to market capitalist democracies that largely leave their private sector to rough and tumble capitalism um, in this space. Because governments tend not to have the agility to be able to meet the response quickly. So I don't think it's liberal democracies. I, th I think it's about the, the style of capitalism. Now, maybe I would say this, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's up to the Americans and the Brits to say, hey, our system is better at this. But I think if you leave your private sector to be able to defend at speed in the way they can, like you let Microsoft, Google, FireEye, um, CrowdStrike get to defending, which is more laissez-faire kind of, kind of British um, and American style of capitalism, I suspect that has an advantage over, over German, French, um, Japanese, Korean styles. Um, and uh, in even, in, or Chinese and Russian styles. But I kind of need a political economist to work with on that. 
Um, so the uh, and the multi uh, multilateral. Uh, I'm sorry. The militarization. Are we drifting? Um, I agree with the drifting, and I agree with the militarization, but. I think of anything it was, and it, I think it would have led to that drift. Um, you know, in the United States, who's had the largest say? It's been, it's been the military. Who's had the, um, who gets the largest budgets? You know, until this last budget, the Department of Defense, like I think it was 2019, got an extra billion dollars to do cyber. And a billion dollars was as much as the entire Department of Homeland Security was getting, not only to defend their own networks, but for all of CISA. The, the cybersecurity agency, right? Just the military plus up was as large as much, was as large as everything that DHS got. In fact, the DOD budget to construct new buildings, their construction budget was as big as what CISA was getting. Um, and so I think that had a, that would have put us in that direction of drift. Um, I think what, what, took away the, the, the steam there was that, was that technology pow, policy is now a subset of um, national security policy because of China. I'm sorry, not because of China, because of the, um, the Western China split, especially the US China split. When I was at the White House doing cybersecurity policy, we knew like technology policy was a subset of innovation and economics. Um, not national security. That's that has flipped, right? That ship has sailed, and now technology is about us and China. And so I think, as much as anything, that that's taken over the motive force there. So in the values-based approach, um, I wouldn't necessarily put it as a value-based approach. Um, um, this is the way that I would do it to tie it in with the the slides that we had covered, right? I don't think that the implied strategy is to do, if that offense has the advantage to do more offense. I think the implied strategy is to do defense, to do defense better. Um, actually just had a um, debate that came out on uh, War on the Rocks podcast with Erica Borgard and Dimitri on this. Um, and so I think like our only strategy, the only one that makes any sense is to get defense better than offense. And so I would root that in sustainability, right? It's not a military issue. It's about sustainability and you borrow from environmentalism, right? In environmentalism, you, you act globally. I'm sorry, you think globally, act locally with, and you've got this accumulated shit that past generations have got us to that we've got to fix for future generations. Boy, that sounds a lot like our issue. And we want sustainability. We want our grandkids' grandkids to have an internet that's at least as amazing as the one that we have today. Now, we don't get that. I don't think we get that by doing more offense. So even if it's an appropriate national security strategy, I don't think you can do it without ruining the internet. And so you know, if you've got to destroy the village to save it, like what, that, what the hell are we doing? Brilliant, absolutely. And if I could take us to a few, we're having quite a few questions come in asking about the US context and the US approach. So if I'll, I'll group a few of those together for you. The first is from Tim Stevens, who's asked, how does the US mitigate the potential escalatory effects of persistent engagement defending forward? We then have uh, Moon Sulfur, who's asked, for your perspective on the US Cyber Diplomacy Act, that's recently been introduced by the House of Representatives. And finally, Franz Stefan Gady has asked, how would your preliminary conclusions on the offense defense balance be different if your focus were on high intensity conflicts between the US and China that would include offensive cyber operations as part of multi-domain operations and informationalized warfare? Great, I might start on that one. Um... First by Franz, and by the way, fantastic to hear all these names. Good, good to see everyone. Um, and um, the actually, Tim, I owe you an email. It doesn't look like it's going to happen, unfortunately. Um, so, Franz, on the on the, I don't think it changes my findings on offense defense, Franz, because I'm, like, I'm looking at how is this going to change under di different circumstances. I think the the traditional IR literature 
because they have looked back at times of relative peace, right? When times when things are relatively stable and they found, look, cyber is not, doesn't, is reversible. Like it's not killing anyone. States are shrugging this off. Um, it's not causing crises. Well, because states generally, I think they haven't adequately um, included in their empiricism that this was all happening in a state when states generally weren't doing high intensity anything against each other. Um, again, there's some exceptions around, there are some important exceptions around North Korea and Iran in that. Um, and so, yeah, I think if states start to say um, they don't want to treat this as pressure release. Um, and this is a paper that I had, um, I'll, I'll pull up the slides. Um, and um, if we, da, 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 da. Um, right, a lot of the IR literature has appropriately said, look, there's press. states are using this as a pressure release, but that can change, right? If, we, if states think a crisis is likely to be coming, then there's all sorts of reasons to use cyber. It's asymmetric. You know, we've got to get in our punch early. If the war is likely to happen on Saturday, then we, we need to hit ours on Friday. And if I think you're going to hit me on Friday, I have to act on Thursday. Um, it totally ties in with the, um, uh, oh, I'm totally blank, uh, Volstetter analysis, the basing study, right? Uh, strategic uh, SAC wanted to base our bombers close to the Soviet Union because it was made for easier offense. And Wolstetter said, well, no, if you've got this amazing offense and worse defense, then all you're doing is inviting a surprise attack. And we have got the same, right? I, I, I am incredulous every time I see an American say, we need to brag more about our offensive capability. No, right? If you've got an amazing offensive capability and a weak defense, and an adversary thinks a crisis is coming, then the only way that they think they can defeat the United States, sorry, I, I'm sorry I'm putting this into United States context. It also, it, it applies in a UK context. It also applies in, in India, potentially in India Pac and Pakistan um, and uh, other regional scenarios. Um, but especially for the United States, because this is where you hear it, like the more we brag about the offense and we have a weak defense, then the only way an adversary North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, might say that they can, see, can, can succeed against us is to get in a surprise cyber attack. This is why I don't mind talking about digital Pearl Harbors anymore. Not as an analogy, but as a direct freaking precedent, right? Before Pearl Harbor, we didn't say, well, we shouldn't be talking about Tarantos or, or Port Alexanders anymore. No, right? Just like, like I'm not saying as an analogy, I'm saying as a direct historical parallel that if the other side feels that they need to get a one up and war is likely, and you've got this exquisite capability, like torpedoes that work in the shallow harbor, harbor of Pearl, uh, shallow waters of Pearl Harbor, then you feel you must use it because war is coming anyhow. As, as um, Dick Betts wrote, if not now, when? If not this, how? Um, so that was a lot on that. And that kind of gets to the, the escalatory of, of persistent engagement there. Th thanks, Tim. Um, right, that's what we're trying to say on this chart, right? Um, for, for Jervis and I, right? As long as both states are in relative peace and both states want to limit conflict, then persistent engagement, I think, is a good operational model operational concept. I think it's a crappy strategy. The cause and effect don't, just don't work out. But Jim, um, you might know Jim Miller. He's a, uh, Dr. Jim Miller, um, Stanford PhD in IR, had been the former number three in the Pentagon. And he said, Jay, just think about, if you think about persistent engagement of kicking the knife out of the hand of the adversary, oh, I can deal with that, right? If we see the Russians are gonna disrupt the freaking Olympics again, how, like, it's kind of churlish to say, well, that might be escalatory. Oh, come on, right? <laughs> disrupting the Olympics. If we're not gonna prevent someone from disrupting the Olympics um, and we can't worry about the escalatory um, too much of that. Um, and so again, I, I like it. 
as an operational model with limitations of saying this is only when kind of states are, are, are at peace. Um, it's only to try and in limited bits of trying to um, of trying to stop other sides operations. As soon as you start promising things are going to get better because we're doing this, again, I don't, I, I don't, I just don't buy it. Um, it might, but I'm, but I'm cautious. And then for Moon, great, great to see you. Um, on the Cyber, Cyber Diplomacy Act, um, generally a fan um, because I think we do need more emphasis on the di diplomatic side. We need more oomph, we need more ambassadors, we need more um, diplomatic effort. We need more people that are not just thinking about this from a militarized sense. Um, the capability building, the um, being at the standards meetings, right? So that it's not just the Chinese technologists that, that the US is able to, to send massive delegations. Um, that we're not only able to convince the like-minded and to, to work with the like-minded countries. Um, I'm sorry that for everyone else, that's, that's shorthand for like those that agree with us. Like, you know, in most cases, you know, the British, the Dutch, the, the Australians um, that have a general view about how international law should apply, um, but also be focusing on the G77 and those that, that aren't already convinced. So I, I'm, I'm generally a, a fabulous fan um, for, uh, for that. Brilliant. Andrew, I think you wanted to ask a question. Um, yeah, um, thanks a lot, Jay. It was absolutely fantastic talk. And as someone who's not in, the, in IR, I'm a political geographer, it's quite interesting to see how um, you're saying IR should move in certain ways to kind of embrace computer science literature, which is what geographers um, have done, um, but not necessarily done a translation into proactive government intervention to increase defensive capability. So I'm wondering whether actually it's not necessarily about capitalism, but maybe that's something to reflect on at a different point when there's actually some other quite good questions as well. Cheers. Yeah. Um, so um, I had a, um, um, I was going to make a rather rude remark about uh, government help to the private sector, but I'm actually work part-time at CISA. So I, I, I better um, limit that. The, and by the way, if you're a physical geographer, right, and, and this like, notion of terrain, like the work that Rattray and Don that has done and others of saying, what is the terrain of cyberspace? How is that? And one of the big differences is that we can shape the terrain, right? The, the earth doesn't care whose army's tank tracks are digging up its mud. The ocean doesn't care who's sailing her waves. In cyberspace, it matters because it's created by people. And the, and the people and organizations that create it know what's happening and it responds in change. The internet is going to be different in a couple of years than it is now. The physical terrain is changing and it is the private sector that creates that change, overwhelmingly that creates that change. Um, and that gets to why the private sector is generally the primary actor on defense because they have the agility the subject matter expertise, and they can change the terrain. In general, governments, especially OECD governments, can't do that. And they generally fail when they try, as the larger states. Smaller states, Estonia, Singapore, where you've got um, fewer companies, the tighter relationship. Um, the UK is kind of in the middle, right? Kind of just big enough to be able to, to, um, to have some oomph, but, but small enough that you can get the same, the people into the same room. Um, Governments, again, larger, richer governments, OECD governments, tend to have more resources, staying power, um, some legit, presumptive legitimacy, a lot less than they think, but some, and access to other levers of power. Right? The prime minister or the president, can, the minister can stand up and say, this is wrong, look at what Russia did, we need everyone to rally together. Um, they can arrest people. They can stab people when they sleep, right? I mean, that's, that's what militaries can do. Very good at it. Um, and, and less so for, um, uh, for you or me or Amy. Uh, and so we're at our best when we bring those together. Um, and so to me, the role of CISO, the role of, um, of these agencies, is you're not going to be able to replicate that, especially the largest players that can have systemic effects, right? Microsoft makes a tiny change 
Google make a tiny change, NTT, BT, and they've got, can have massive impacts that affects millions or billions of devices. Um, and that's what we were getting at on this chart. Most of what we do tends to be technology inside the enterprise, which you have no effect, right? Even if we invented the perfect device for cybersecurity, you've got to deploy it a billion times, train people on a billion of it, maintain them, keep it patched. It, when Microsoft did um, automated updates in the 90s, they did it once and it helped a billion all at once. And so those are the solutions um, that we more need. Did that, did that get to where you were going with that? Yeah, I, I think it was more the kind of small to medium enterprise, right? Because I, I agree that they have, the large corporations have huge systemic impacts. Right, right, right. But how that then gets translated for maybe supply chain actors, right? Who yeah, might yeah. be smaller, that's where I was kind of headed. And yeah, thank, and thank, thanks for focusing me there. And that's what we we're trying to do in that New York Cyber Task Force report was to say, like, when we think about the private sector, you've got the private sector actors um, that can influence cyberspace um, and offensive operations that are happening there. The cybersecurity providers, the, tel the telcos and, and ISPs. Um, and then you got the rest of us that are largely just victims. And so what are those changes that we can do that can affect that? Um, like cloud has been one of the biggest changes that we have done. Um, right. I don't know if you follow on Twitter, but a lot of a lot of folks were saying, "Man, if you're still running your own Microsoft, out, you know, Exchange, what are you doing?" Right. Just let Microsoft do that, and just think about what that means for systemic. Right. And for the folks that say there is no systemic, that the you know one of the main areas that computer science security folks are saying is, "Don't run your own system. Change the dyadic." that all of us should be not running your own Microsoft because you can't secure it well enough and let Microsoft run that on their own. And that's what cloud thing is that the cloud is allowing to do, that the concentration of the defensive operations, <coughs> protective operations amongst those that can do it best that are operating the infrastructure and the software at the same time. Thank you. And I think that's a great point at which to wrap up we're at time um thank you so so much jason for your energy and bringing so many ideas to us today i think you've given me a lot to think about and a lot to read as well i suspect the same is for attendees um broad thank you to everyone we had a lot of questions we couldn't get to um so yeah you've, you've kicked off a lot um so sorry if we didn't get to anyone's questions there but i do hope you enjoyed it um yeah Nothing else to say. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Great. Thank, it's good to see a lot, a lot of friends on here. And um, thanks very much. And, and look forward to future sessions from the Offensive Cyber Working Group. Absolutely. Cheers. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.